Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello, let us continue our discussion on this plastic deformation. In the last class, we looked at uh, what are all the uh, fundamental issues uh, with regard to yield criterion or fracture criterion and so on. We looked at uh, two important uh, yield criterion. Though there are different uh, yield criterions are uh, uh, proposed, uh, the popular ones are uh, the Tresca yield criterion that is also called maximum shear stress criterion. The other one is called uh, one mises or distortion energy criterion. It is also called octahedral uh, maximum shear stress criterion so on. And then we also looked at uh, the maximum uh, principal normal stress fracture criterion which is mostly uh, suitable for brittle materials. On the other hand, these two other criteria uh, suitable for ductile materials. At the end, we also looked at uh, the criterion, which is uh, uh, these criterions, how they are modified in the in, in case of uh, uh, semi-crystalline or polymeric uh, materials or long molecular chain materials, uh, incorporating this pressure effect how these expressions are modified and some new empirical models were proposed and this is what we have seen. So now uh, we will move on to the deformation uh, behavior itself and uh, the first uh, topic we are going to address is uh, deformation mechanisms of uh, single crystals and then we looked at we look at the uh, what are all the uh, aspects which describe the deformation mechanisms in a single crystal then we will move on to polycrystal deformations. So if you look at uh, what are the primary mechanisms uh, which governs the deformation is uh, first is slip and the rest twinning. We will first see what is slip. Slip uh, in a crystal crystallographic uh, terms uh, when you uh, describe it the slipping of uh, a large uh, portion of crystal crystal aggregate. So that is a slip, normal slip. And the slip is described by a term called slip system. Now, okay, what is slip system? Slip, slip system consists of two quantities. One is slip plane, a plane allowing the easiest slippage, okay, in a very simple term. Wide interplanar spacings and highest planar densities. These are all the very uh, important uh, requirements of uh, for the easy slip that has to take place. Okay. And then a slip direction, direction of the moment, highest linear density. So a slip system consists of a slip plane and a slip direction. And these are all the attributes. Now let us look at the example of, uh, you know, highest dense uh, plane and so on. For example, here we have taken the uh, face centered cubic uh, crystal unit cell. And what you are seeing here is the 111 uh, plane, which is also we have just seen in the previous lecture called octahedral plane. And this plane is the has the highest uh, planar density in an FCC system. And what you are seeing in that uh, pink color uh, arrows indicating the, the direction. You have a three uh, direction uh, which can be uh, easily identified from this. And uh, if you take out this plane and then put it in a planar view and this is how it looks uh, like this. So there are uh, A, B and then C type of uh, atoms and then they're all stacked uh, one on the other and the, in the planar view for the top view I would say from this corner if you see it will all look like this A, B, C. Okay. So FCC slip occurs on 111 planes that is uh, you see that 111 is uh, denoted by a flower bracket that means it's a family of planes. There are also close packed planes in 110 a direction. This is also a family of directions. It's also called close pack direction. There are about 12 slip systems in um, 
face-centered cubic lattice or uh, face-centered cubic crystal and um, and then we will see how dislocation proceeds. Dislocation proceeds because, uh, because of the two uh, aspects. Uh, first is uh, because we are applying a load uh, which is uh, measured as uh, stress and because of that the dislocation moves in the crystal. That is the primary action that takes place, results in the deformation. So uh, this is a, a schematic which shows where uh, we applied we apply the tensile force uh, is F and uh, the cylindrical member is getting slipped and the slipped area you can see that uh, and this is a slip direction and applied tensile stress is uh, sigma is equal to F by A force by unit area and we, we know that uh, crystal slip due to a resolved shear stress tau R resolved shear stress. So this we have uh, already know that uh, a total stress or normal stress can be uh, resolved into shear stress and normal stress. Okay, a total stress can be resolved into normal stress and shear stress. So slip, uh, I mean the, the shear uh, causes by the resolved shear stress component of the stress, applied stress. So applied tension can produce uh, such a stress and um, the resolved shear stress is uh, tau r is equal to the, the shear force uh, divided by the, the area uh, where the shear uh, force is acting which will give the resolved shear stress. And if you look at the uh, this schematic and it uh, clearly depicts that uh, the, the area which is subjected to the shear force as well as the plane. Uh, on which the shear force is acting. So, and then you see this NS is a slip plane normal, uh, just to give the uh, illustration uh, clearly between this uh, applied tensile stress versus resolved shear stress. And then if you look at the relation between sigma and tau r, uh, we can just further, uh, you know, expand this uh, tau r is equal to Fs by Ax. If you look at uh, what is Fs and uh, what is As and then for that I need to bring a more schematic here. Uh, this is the, the cylindrical member which is subjected to slip and then it's a slip plane and then this uh, slip direction and the, the force is uh, tensile force, uniaxial force and the area of the cylinder is A here and this is the uh, the green line is normal to the slip plane which is uh, kept at an angle 45 degree here and the angle between the slip plane normal to the tensile axis is phi and the angle between the slip direction and the tensile force is lambda. So now coming back to this uh, the relation between uh, sigma and tau r. And tau r, uh, okay, uh, is equal to Fs, that is uh, shear force divided by the area of the plane where the shear uh, force is experienced. So Fs is F times cos lambda. That means the the, the component, the, the stress component, which is uh, contributing to this uh, force in this um, lambda that is in this direction the the force which is perpendicular to the to this and then the component which contributes to this uh, slip plane is f cos lambda similarly the area uh, this is a this is a perpendicular i mean per, i mean this is the a which is uh, where we see that you know the force is perpendicular to this plane but then the area which is actually uh, subjected to the shear force is given by A divided by cos phi because of this uh, angular relationship. So if you um, look at this substitutions then what you will see here is uh, tau r is equal to sigma cos lambda 
cos phi. So that is the kind of relation you get for the uh, sigma and tau r. So this is a fundamental uh, yeah, requirement for the slip to take place. Okay. So this is. Uh, it is not that the resolved shear stress uh, of any um, quantity will cause slip. There is something called critical resolved shear stress. That means uh, it is a kind of a condition for a dislocation motion. If you recall, we have also seen that a stress required to move a dislocation. So, Pearl's number equation, if you recall, it is something uh, similar to that. You can, you can relate that. Uh, of course, there it is assumed that the crystal is free of any other dislocation, just one dislocation in a, a perfect crystal. Right? That's, uh, that's quite. Uh, but here we are talking about a bulk. A initial condition could be of any kind. But here also it is a single crystal. The condition for dislocation motion, the TR should be greater than tau. Sorry, tau r, not tr. Tau r should be greater than tau c r s s. So it should be greater than the resolved shear stress should be greater than critical resolved shear stress that is required to move the dislocation. That is how you should look at it. So the critical resolved shear stress uh, values are typically of 10 to the power minus 4 GPA to 10 to the power minus 2 GPA. The crystal orientation can make it easy or hard to move a dislocation. Okay, this is very important. Uh, we will look at the details as we uh, move along. And uh, the tau r is equal to sigma cos lambda cos phi. So that that clearly shows that the orientation is uh, very important, and we will show this by some schematic to explicitly arrive at uh, the condition of uh, a slip. So here you see that this uh, the rectangular member is subjected to a tensile force, and then suppose if you uh, assume that uh, the lambda is 90 degree, and then the then what happens to the critical resolved shear stress? Then then it is zero because lambda will become zero here. I mean lambda is equal to sorry lambda if it is 90, then this component will become zero, and then entire tr sorry tau r will, will become zero. Uh, on the other hand, if you take uh, uh, lambda and phi is 45 degree, then it gives uh, a value tau r is equal to sigma by 2. Okay. On the other hand, if you make uh, phi is equal to 90 degree, then also tau r becomes 0. So what it uh, means is uh, the tau maximum at lambda and phi is equal to 45 degree. Okay. So this is... Um, one simple substitution which illustrates the maximum resolved shear stress is obtained at the angle of 45. This we have already seen in the so, uh, in the yield criterion even before that in the shear stress plane and all that we have seen several times. The maximum tau max is uh, occurring at 45. So, if you look at the plastic flow in a single crystal, so this is how the, the crystal uh, uh, will slip and then we can uh, uh, look at the slip lines, the slip, the slip plane will uh, appear like this uh, against this uh, shear force direction and uh, each one will uh, have the, you know, the, the slip planes need not be uh, uniform like this, it could be randomly uh, it, I would say that it's a random aggregates of the slip plane will uh, appear at, uh, with the non-uniform uh, distance between them. So this is just a schematic which I'm trying to show. So this is how the slip uh, plane will look like and the other hand the other mechanism string will uh, look like this uh, and we will see the details uh, in few minutes but uh, what you see is uh, here is uh, this is a uh, untwinned plane and this is a twin planes and then in between you have the twinned region and these are of the shear uh, stress directions and uh, this is a, a single crystal metallic sample which you can see that uh, the real-time experiment which uh, is given in this uh, text uh, I just brought to give a, an example how the 
slip print. This is exactly uh, looking like what we have just uh, shown in this schematic, the real time uh, slip, uh, I mean slip regions will exactly look like this. Sorry. So now we'll go a little more into the uh, slip system. Uh, each crystal has a number of uh, characteristic slip systems. So very important, uh, we are talking about uh, different type of crystal systems. So each crystal system has got a characteristic slip systems. For example, FCC we have already seen a slip takes place in 111 type of octahedral planes and one uh, bar one zero direction. And we have four type of uh, 111 planes and uh, three 110 direction, so which is shown here in this uh, schematic. And uh, 4 into 3 is a 12 slip systems. Okay, so you have examples uh, copper, nickel, aluminium, lead, gold, silver, gamma, iron, so on. They all belong to uh, these kind of crystal systems. And if you go to BCC uh, crystal, that is body centered uh, crystal lattice. So you have uh, uh, 111, uh, sorry, 110 plane and 111 direction of uh, this one. This type of uh, slip system is uh, displayed by alpha iron, tungsten, molybdenum, beta brass. So they have what about 12 systems and uh, there are other system 211 is a plane and 111 is direction. This slip system is also readily active in alpha, iron, molybdenum, tungsten and sodium. So this again contributes to another 12 slip system. And uh, the third slip system which exhibits, uh, which the BCC exhibits is uh, 3, 2, 1 planes and 111 direction. Which is, uh, which is giving rise to about 24 uh, system like alpha iron and potassium. So all these uh, directions are uh, marked here for the rough pick reference. So if you look at the uh, you know, number of slip systems as compared to uh, FCC, they are a war. Okay? But the problem is BCC crystals are not close back. The slip predominantly occurs in 11 zero planes that has the highest atomic density okay so you have to remember that similarly if you look at the slip systems in a hexagonal closed packed crystal and the the primary slip systems are uh, the basal uh, plane so this you can see that it's a basal plane and the directions are given here three directions zero 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 one basal plane and one 1, 2 bar 0, means 3 directions, so 1 into 3, 3. Examples of this kind of slip system uh, exists in cadmium, zinc, magnesium, titanium, beryllium. And um, another type of uh, slip system, 1, 0, bar 1, 0, slip planes, and uh, this is called prism plane, and 1, 1, to bar zero direction, you have uh, three planes like this, and then one direction, so three slip systems. Titanium, magnesium, they also show you no know, pyramidal planes. You can see that pyramidal planes, which is shown here. This is uh, pyramidal planes, and the same direction. So you have six uh, pyramidal planes of uh, similar direction, so six six uh, systems. So in you see again in uh, HCP uh, about uh, 12 slip systems, but the problem with the HCP is it is uh, very sensitive to the C by A ratio. If uh, HCP crystals have high C by A ratio, slip occurs along basal planes, that is 0, 0, 0, 1 plane, type of planes. For crystals with uh, low C by A ratio, slip also occurs in this type of prism planes. Okay, so this is one thing we have to remember. So you see that uh, compared to uh, FCC, both BCC and FCC do not have a high dense uh, planes. Okay, 
that's uh, bottom line. So if you look at uh, a little more uh, detail about this plastic flow in single crystals, um, so we have seen that the plastic flow initiates when tau CRSS reaches some critical value characteristic of the material. Okay, so the stress is designated tau CRSS and is related to the tensile yield stress sigma through this relation that is sigma y is equal to m times tau CRSS. Okay. So this is also known as the Schmidt law. So the CRSS, tau CRSS is invariant for a given material. Okay. So, so the value of tau CRSS depends on test conditions such as temperature and strain rate as well as the structural features such as materials initial dislocation density and purity. So here is a, a, an important plot that uh, we need to keep in mind when we as uh, with regards to the critical resolved shear stress is concerned. So the critical resolved shear stress is plotted here uh, against the temperature tau CRSS versus T plot. You can see that uh, it is not only showing the temperature uh, variable, there is also a strain rate variable. Okay. The, the, the dashed line is uh, epsilon 1 dot, which is greater than epsilon 2 dot. Okay. So the solid line is epsilon 2 dot. That is, uh, okay. So, uh, so it shows both effects, temperature effect as well as uh, strain rate effect. So what does it show? Uh, it's very interesting actually. You can see that uh, this plot exhibits uh, almost three regions, the region 1, region 2 and region 3. Okay. And then what are the critical points to be noted? What are the critical points? In region 3, what is that we are seeing? The T is less than or equal to 0 0.7 Tm. Tau CRSS decreases rapidly with the increasing temperature. Okay, so you can see that the in region three, the tau CRSS decreases rapidly with increasing the temperature. Okay, it it is it also function of strain rate. The so strain rate is also it is a function of strain rate. So that means in both strain rates they look different. So that means it is sensitive to strain rate as well. If you compare the region 1 where the temperature is greater than or equal to 0 0.25 Tm, the tau CRSS is function of temperature and strain rate. We can rewrite this tau CRSS equal to t tau A plus tau star. What is this tau A? Where the tau A is the a thermal component of the stress and tau star is the thermally dependent, uh, very important. Okay. So you have a temperature dependent term and a thermal component, temperature independent term. Okay. The tau CRS, CRSS has got two terms, Ta and, sorry, tau A and tau star. In effect, tau star approaches zero at the temperature marking the transition from region 1 to 2. This is true because the moment it reaches this plateau, then it starts the region 2 till the end, it is zero. The temperature um, dependent component tau star is zero in the region 2. 